Great. <clears throat> Excuse me. Great. Thanks, Ryan, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, appreciate the opportunity to be here today to, to talk you through some of this information. I think, um, as Ryan said, we hope you can uh, keep an open mind as we go through this. I think some of the numbers we're going to show you are going to be surprising to some folks, but I can tell you, and I will say this multiple times during my presentation, these are real numbers. These are numbers that were taken directly from programs I worked on, uh, including drugs that some would argue would be some of the more successful antibiotics commercialized today. So. I'll point that out as I go through, but remember, these are real numbers from real programs. So the focus uh, of my presentation today is to go through a couple of specific topics. These are things that, um, that start out in some cases like AST or surveillance as the basis of approval, but they do turn into post-marketing commitments or things that are needed to commercialize the drug as you go forward. And then other topics, including the, the actual post-marketing commitments that the FDA and in some cases the, M the EMA um, ask for. And then some other sort of internal costs, so pharmacovigilance and medical affairs, and why those are important and what they cost uh, going forward. So I'll start with um, the FDA commitments. So this is sort of a, a playbook of what you are typically asked to do. Uh, there is almost always a pediatric commitment. Um, this, this would include things like designing a dose for pediatric patients. So there's a series of PK studies to make sure that you fully uh, fully have vetted the correct dose. And when we say pediatrics, we're talking about anybody under 18 years old. So you can imagine that there's a lot of work that goes into trying to design a dose for a 17-year-old versus a neonate and everything in between. So there's a lot of work that has to happen there to design a dose that's appropriate for each of these age, each of these age groups. After that work's done, then you're asked to conduct a pediatric study in, in patients for each indication that has been approved. So in some cases, that's a full efficacy study. In many cases, it's, a, it's more of a safety-focused study uh, and to prove that the, the dose that you have selected is correct in patient populations. But this work is, is required. And I, I should have said up front, I, I'm not actually commenting on whether or not I believe these are important. I do actually believe everything I'm going to talk about is incredibly important medically. Um, and so that's not the basis of the discussion. It's truly just to talk about and be transparent about costs. Um, in addition, there's sometimes additional efficacy studies that are requested. So again, uh, these are two examples from the real world. Uh, many gram-positive drugs that come to market would be asked to run a neonatal sepsis study. Um, for example, ceftaroline. This was a post-marketing post -marketing commitment we had for that drug. Uh, I just heard that it actually just completed this week or sometime in the, in the recent past uh, 10 years after the drug was approved. That study's been ongoing or under discussion. Um, in addition, additional pneumonia studies are often requested, particularly in CAP. So we've seen a few examples of those recently. Again, I'll, I'll call out ceftaroline since it's something I worked on. The basis of approval was running another phase three study in MRSA CAP to round out the label. So there was another, another study that was requested. There's been some others in CAP recently that have had additional requests as well. Um, again, appropriately so, building out your PK story in adult patients, uh, what we call special populations. So typically, you would run PK studies that are required during development to uh, execute your phase three program. But you may have missed a, a particular group of people. You may not have run your phase three trial in elderly patients, and so you would need to run uh, to, to validate your dose in a PK study in elderly patients. If you have a fixed dose versus a weight-based dose drug, you may be asked to look at obese patients. You may be asked to look at patients with end-stage renal disease, and on and on. So there's often totally appropriate, but a number of requirements on the PK side that you're, you're asked to conduct. And then finally is five years of surveillance. We heard a little bit about that earlier today from Mariana. Again, extremely important. Once you launch the drug, you want to make sure that you're not changing the epidemiology of resistance, but it's an ongoing commitment for five years in the United States, often the same in Europe, and sometimes that can be extended depending on what you're seeing. So what does all that mean? Let me show you some costs. Again, these are real numbers. I'm going to say that again. So. I'm giving you three examples, uh, three different drugs, uh, two of which I worked on, one of which is related to a drug I worked on, but also these are numbers that I have collected from colleagues at other pharmaceutical companies. And these numbers are going to get much bigger. This is just the beginning of the discussion, so uh, hold on. So <clears throat> for a drug with a single indication, essentially the absolute minimum requirement, you just got to prove for skin and skin structure infections, UTI, one, one infection, very narrow list of pathogens the total pediatric commitment is going to run you about $25 million. This is spread out over five years, so it's not totally onerous, but when we show you later what revenue looks like typically for antibiotics, you'll see why this starts to build a case towards this being a, a, a challenge. Um, 
So $25 million over a couple of years. In this case, I'm, I've assumed that you have not been asked to run another phase three study because, again, this was a very simple, straightforward approval. But maybe two or three PK studies need to be run that are going to cost about $2 million. And assuming that this is a fairly narrow spectrum drug, gram positive only, or say enterobacteriaceae only, you're going to spend about $3 million in surveillance over five years. That's not all every year. In the middle case, I've got a, a more complicated drug. Um, maybe you have two indications at this point, and so you have now doubled your pediatric commitment to something like $50 million, but you've also been asked to run another phase three study, which is gonna also cost you $50 million. If you don't run that phase three study, you're going to be getting some feedback from the agencies on not having run those studies, and, and eventually uh, it could lead to fines and even the drug being taken off the market because those are absolutely required. Again, PK and special adult populations, maybe there's a few additional studies because you have additional indications. And now your surveillance costs may increase because this may be a more broad spectrum drug. So now you're looking at $108 million versus 30, spread over four to five years post-launch. And then finally, uh, sort of the, the, the most expensive case, again, this is sort of a ceftaroline Kazavi um, hybrid from, from my past experience. $75 million in pediatric commitment because you now have three indications. Uh, you probably are asked to do more than one additional efficacy study. Uh, as I mentioned with ceftaroline, we had both MRSA cap and neonatal sepsis, so you're looking at more like $75 million. Additional PK studies, additional surveillance, $160 million over five years. But we're going to add to that. So that's just the, that's the first topic. So, uh, so let me talk a little bit about some of the challenges of these studies and why they take so long to run and why they cost so much. Because you would think that if a study takes a long time to enroll, you're spreading the cost out over a long period of time, that would be better, but that's not actually the case. So the first is that the FDA and the EMA both have pediatric requirements, and they may only partially overlap. Depending on what your drug is, they may not be the exact same requirements. And there's all sorts of mechanisms to harmonize those requirements. Uh, the FDA and the EMA have done a great job of making those avenues of, available for discussion, but that requires that the, the, the uh, company bringing these drugs forward have done simultaneous submissions of the NDA and the MAA. If you launch in, or if you file for regulatory approval in Europe three years after the FDA, you're going to have a difficult time harmonizing those, those programs. Um, and the complexity and the cost only increase as you try and build in a single study that harmonizes across both regulatory agencies. I've already touched on this a bit, but pediatric studies can be very difficult to enroll. You can imagine that there are a lot of parents out there who would prefer not to enroll their newborns into studies with investigational medications. So I put five years here. Actually, uh, I know of one drug that it took 14 years to complete the, uh, the commitments. Many drugs, they get renegotiated later. They never actually finish all of this work because it's very difficult to do. And so this comes to the, the cost bit. So doesn't it make sense that if you could run these studies over a long period of time, it would be cheaper. No, because you need the full attention of a full clinical development team that's trying to do other things at the same time. And when I say clinical development team, I don't need, mean a clinician. I mean a clinician maybe with a few junior staff, a microbiologist, a PKPD scientist, a clinical pharmacologist, a PK scientist, a toxicologist, uh, all the biostats functions. Uh, you need clinical drug trial supply on and on and on in addition to, uh, in clinical operations, in addition to all the CROs that you're working with. So these costs uh, continue, uh, continue to, to build as over time. And that's all happening while you're trying to build out a sales, commercial, and medical affairs team, and maybe while you're trying to actually expand the label for your drug. This is one of the reasons why companies often don't pursue a label expansion stra uh, strategy, because there just isn't enough money to staff all the pediatric requirements, uh, build out a sales and commercial organization, and then run additional studies. And I'll talk a little bit about how we get that work done under the medical affairs umbrella. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to mention one of the ways that people talk about reducing costs here is doing intercompany trials. So if you could share a control group, couldn't you reduce the cost of a trial? This has been tried one time that I'm aware of. Uh, it, it, we didn't quite get it off the ground, but there are ways you could potentially do this. But this requires two drugs with the same exact spectrum of activity, ideally the same dosing schedule, uh, because you have to blind the control um, and they have to be going through development at the same time. Right. So this almost never happens. I mean, that has to spontaneously occur in nature, which just doesn't, doesn't happen very often. Uh, pharmacovigilance. So I put the definition from the Oxford Dictionary up there about pharmacovigilance for those who aren't familiar with this, this uh, topic, but it, it's essentially global drug safety reporting. Um, this seems like a fairly straightforward topic because it's 
you collect information from the field and you report it. However, this requires a very large infrastructure of people. You are required to have regional safety physicians, at least one in Europe and one in the US, and anywhere else you launch, you need to have people on the ground in those countries actively monitoring safety. There's usually a pharmacovigilance head that's overseeing all this. You need, in, you need input from your clinical development team because remember, they're actively running all these trials we just talked about and there's new safety information coming out from all of those. And they also have to weigh in on data interpretation and safety signals that are, that are coming in. You've got input from your non-clinical team. As a microbiologist, if I find that I have a resistance problem because I just launched my new product, that gets reported into the safety system. Same with your toxicologists and your clinical pharmacology colleagues. Medical affairs, field force is often your frontline uh, liaison with people actively using the drug. So they may get reports directly themselves and have to report those up into the medical information line. Uh, there's a regulatory component to how all of, the, all of these things are reported. And then CMC or manufacturing. So many parts of drug safety are driven by the metabol or the, uh, the excipients and the manufacturing byproducts that are in your product. If those change over time, those need to be reported. And if there's any safety signals associated with that, they get reported. On the right side is the list of all the reports that need to be filed every year, at least the ones that, that I'm aware of. Um, quarterly and annually, there's a report of safety that goes to the FDA. Um, in addition to that, you have to update your IND annually to include all new data, but especially any safety signals. There's what's called the Drug Safety Update Report, or DSUR, which is sort of the European equivalent of the annual report, has a more global focus, updated every year. Your investigator brochure, um, if you have ongoing clinical trials, is a piece of, uh, it's, a, it's a large document that summarizes anything that was, anybody that was investigating the drug could turn to as an, sort of an encyclopedia on the drug. That needs to be updated with any new safety data every year. And then you have an annual surveillance reporting requirement to the FDA, um, which doesn't necessarily fall under this category if you aren't having resistance as a major issue, but if it does show up, that needs to factor into this report as well. So you can imagine having all of these people plus the global infrastructure I've pointed, to, uh, pointed out in the middle. So you have a, a global product complaint system and a global, global database infrastructure. All of this costs uh, conservatively about a million dollars a year in perpetuity for the life of the drug. Very important, but uh, sort of a cost we don't talk about. OK, medical affairs. So <clears throat> I'm going to make a bold statement here and say, at least recently, US clinical trial experience with new products rarely happens. Um, Maybe it's non-existent. It's probably something less than that, but it's limited. Let's call it limited. Part of the reason for that is that for certain types, types of infections, the way that we have to conduct trials is not compatible with healthcare practice in the US. A UTI trial requires a patient to be hospitalized for seven days. Nobody does that in the US unless there's other extraneous factors going on, and you wouldn't want those patients in your trial because they're complicated. Um, and, and availability of patients can be challenging for those of us that have run CRE trials or for other highly resistant, uh, if you're looking for multidrug, pseudomo multidrug resistant pseudomonas, for example, these pathogens are very rare in the US, although we talk about them frequently. They're limited to specific institutions, they're limited to outbreaks, they're limited to certain wards in the hospital that may not be participating in your clinical trial. So it's difficult to find these patients in the context of a trial. So all of these are just examples, but these contribute to lack of data amongst US prescribers when you launch a product. That lack of data leads to lack of awareness, and so you have to rectify that. So that is why we spend quite a bit of money on advisory boards and speaker programs to get people trained, uh, get people to understand the data. And most importantly, why we invest a lot of money in investigator-initiated research and local microbiology studies. Well, what do these two things mean? So in investigator-initiated research you know, for those of you that aren't familiar, are studies where an investigator would request a grant to conduct a clinical study, often sometimes non-clinical, but usually clinical, to look at a different subset of patients, a different approach to dosing, whatever that may be, uh, to sort of round out the clinical data package from the phase three program to make it more relevant to US physicians um, or European physicians or wherever the program may be running. These studies can be very expensive, but they're incredibly important because they typically are, are sort of at arm's length. The pharma company provides a grant and doesn't necessarily get involved with much of the actual work, so it's sort of an independent assessment. The local microbiology studies are required because most hospitals would like to know how your drug performs against the, the bugs that are coming in their door, and so you often will conduct uh, sort of small studies with just about every hospital uh, that wants to, wants to put your drug in the formulary. So all in, not factoring in the personnel. So this does not count the field force that, uh, that works with, with our colleagues in the, in, uh, in the, on the clinical side. Uh, this is just the cost of what's here. 
runs about, I would estimate, five to $15 million a year based on the experience uh, that I've had more recently. Okay, and then finally, AST devices. Some of you have heard me talk about this before, but I will talk about it some more here, especially on the, on the cost side. So um, a full suite of AST devices, a, f a full uh, development program, and I'm not talking about um, any of the newer diagnostics. This is just the standard sort of typical diagnostics that most hospitals use, is gonna run a pharmaceutical company around $5 million over time. So this is working with about eight or nine different manufacturers, um, but, but these are the actual development costs that the pharma company is directly charged. The issue is that although the drug launched, many of these costs don't hit until after because most of this cost is related to the automated systems that require the package insert to be finalized before they can finish their development. So you launch the product and all of a sudden now you've got two, three, four million dollars worth of AST costs um, that you have to manage. Of course, these costs increase if your package insert isn't what you told the company it was gonna be in the first place. You said you were gonna have 10 pathogens and a breakpoint of 64, and you get a breakpoint of one and one pathogen, they have to start all over again. So, so these costs go up from there. And then in addition, there's these hidden costs. You know, we, to develop these, uh, these devices, we provide for free a whole bunch of drug to these companies, and it's, it's absolutely part of what's needed, but that, that drug costs quite a bit of money, as, as Craig will talk about going forward and then internal resources that are dedicated to this development. While all of that's happening, in order to facilitate use uh, in the field, we put together a, a whole series of steps to sort of facilitate use on the ground, and that's, that's um, sort of required, especially in the first six months to a year of, of a product launch. And we do a few things. First of all, we make our UO devices, so research use only devices available for validation. A clinical lab cannot use a new AST device for a new drug without going through a pretty extensive validation process that's mandated by CLIA and CAP. And they don't, it costs a lot of money to do that. So to help facilitate that, we provide the devices for free, typically. We also provide a CDC reference panel. So we go out, we find isolates, we pay for them, we validate them, we provide them for free to the public. And that's part of, part of the program here as well. And then often we provide an AST send-out service so you can send your isolates to a local uh, lab that has done the validation set up uh, and, then, and then they'll uh, return the data to you. So all in, an AST program is probably gonna cost you about $7 million if you do all the, the extra work that I described on the bottom. And so what does that translate to? So here's my final slide on this topic. I'll be back later to talk about the investing side, but here's the updated numbers. So those same three programs I described, on the left, your cost now went from 30 million to 92 million, 170 million in the middle case, and 220 million in the far right case. Um, and again, I can tell you these are real numbers. Um, the, the case on the right is within $3 million of what we actually spent on one of the programs that, that I used as a reference here. So um, I'll stop there. I'll hand it over to Craig to talk about supply chain and um, manufacturing costs. <laughs> 